Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, quite a few familiar faces and a couple of not quite so familiar faces. Welcome everybody. Um, our special presenter this evening is John Trist, VK2MOP, all the way from Daniloquin. So thank you, John, for making the effort to come and be with us this evening. We're looking forward to your presentation. Um, John is an ex-SAS patrol signaller, and his presentation this evening is military radio in the SAS. So that's something that I'm certainly looking forward to. We'll hand over to John. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Neil. Uh, fellows, my name's John Trist. I come from uh, Deniliquin, about a couple of hours north of here, and uh, I've held an amateur radio licence since 1994. But uh, prior to that, uh, I was an SAS patrol SIG, not to be confused with the regimental signal, who comes from the core of signals. Uh, one of my jobs in the SAS patrol was to look after the communications in the early days. As you get a little bit more uh, seniority, somebody else would take over the SIG set and you'd be doing something else uh, within the patrol. I'll talk about a little, little bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, fellas, there's only two things I don't want to talk about tonight. Uh, the first one is the Brereton Inquiry that everybody uh, knows something about. And the other one is uh, the counter-terrorist role um, that SAS has got. I don't think anybody outside of the unit needs to know anything about that. But it suffice to say that if you get caught in any sort of a situation where there are, you, be, you are a hostage, um, if SAS are involved, there's a good chance uh, that you'll come out of it uh, pretty much unscathed. Unlike the, uh, uh, the sideshow in, in Sydney uh, with the cafe. So uh, that turned out to be pretty untidy. And a lot of people were quite critical of it at the time, and I think it's still being talked about. Uh, tonight, during my presentation, I just want to talk about the three radios that I've got here tonight. There wouldn't be a, uh, a club in Australia, I don't think, that hasn't got members that's got a Kodan radio. Okay, they're a very robust radio. Uh, and they're really suited to vehicles, as we know. They'll take a bit of a hammering in the bush and uh, they do a really, really good job. The next one is the ANPRC 64 set that I carried overseas in SOS. And I've got a lot of time for that little radio. It's a very, very good bit of kit. And the third one is the PRC 320 Klansman that was in service with the British Army from 1976 through to 2010. So that's 34 years for a radio to be in service. I think that says something for how good that particular radio is. I'll just give a little bit of um, history on my service with SAS. In 1967, I was working for Dalgetty's in Dunorquin uh, on the merchandise side. And after a couple of years, I thought to myself, uh, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. So I volunteered for national service. My mother rang me at work one day and said, I don't ever open your mail, but there's a letter here from the Department of Labor and National Service, and you've missed out on the call up. She was pretty happy about that. So the next day I volunteered. So that made her very unhappy. So uh, that was in about the, uh, May of 1969. Uh, on the 30th of September 1969, I found myself in Wagga uh, doing my recruit training. And uh, I was there for 10 weeks, and I made it known to them quite clearly that I wanted to go to SAS, and I wanted that marked on my record. So in those days, to go to SAS, you had to come from infantry. You couldn't come from medical corps or signals corps or uh, artillery or any of those other corps. You had to come from infantry. And uh, that had a lot of advantages because you're doing weapon training and a lot of field stuff um, at a pretty high level uh, as an infantier. So the transition would be a bit easier if you came from infantry. So uh, after 10 weeks at Singleton doing my uh, infantry corps training, I fronted the selection board and I got off the train on the 23rd of March 1970 
in Perth and that very day I commenced my six and a half week selection course uh, to join SAS. Now the basic course now to join SAS is not six and a half weeks, it's about three and a half weeks. I was a bit critical of that at the time, but I can tell you that they are still churning out as good a soldier today in three and a half weeks as we were uh, all those years ago uh, in 1970 when it was six and a half weeks uh, duration. They, they test them very thoroughly and uh, the, the unit today is in very, very good hands. Now, uh, basically, if you go to SAS and you're uh, qualified as I became on the 8th of May 1970, after six and a half weeks, you get the option to go to the troop that you would like to serve in. So the three choices are, you can become a free faller, which is what I wanted to do, and I stayed there for eight and a half years doing the free falling. Uh, or you can be a water operator, where they'd be inserted by submarine or inflatable, or uh, all the other good stuff that they've got now, or you can go to vehicle mounted. And of course, vehicle mounted has become very, very important since about 1991, when SAS got involved in the first Gulf War, and then Afghanistan and Iraq. So uh, who would have known? The other thing that we didn't know at the time, and this is a bit of an aside, because I'm just giving you a bit of background, is we also went up to Marble Bar catching camels. And at the time, we thought we'd use those for continental defence. If there was any, any sort of an invasion from the north, then uh, we might like to use camels and donkeys and horses uh, to move around in and to carry gear and cache it and all the rest of it. So we went up there and we caught camels in the wild on a station called Mount Edgar, about 40 miles east of Marble Bar. And of course, that's, that really got me interested in communications too, because we were working from Marble Bar all the way back to Perth with, uh, with CW. Now, uh, just a little bit more about um, communications within SAS itself. Most of the communications in my time, I'll say most, I really mean predominantly, was by CW, and every message was encoded. So, we had radios, VHF radios, that would work line of sight um, in the field, but we rarely used them. Most of the time, we used this radio here, okay? That 64 set. We did have a bigger radio that we used um, in base camps. You probably heard of the 47 set and the 106 set. They were predominantly vehicle mounted or base sets. And uh, they had a, a fair bit more power and very, very good radios. Fellas, I just want to give you a quick rundown on this. This is not going to be of terrible, in great interest, I don't think, but this is a little Kodan model 6924 Mark II. It's called um, a lunchbox radio for the, the obvious reason. It's only 30 watts. It's very, very simple to use. It's in a nice little robust um, uh, container. It, it tunes really well, it's got its own tuner. And just over the last week or two, I've been running uh, 16 metres or 52 feet of that wire up my tower at about 25 feet in an NFEG configuration straight into the radio here and putting a decent earth in. And I've been getting through to Alice Springs most afternoons about five o'clock on the VKS737 sked, and I've also been getting through to Charters Towers and Charleville. So that just gives you an idea. If you put a decent earth down and you've got a fairly good antenna, and something as simple as that, 16 metres of wire, and I've been working st straight through to um, Alice Springs with, and getting a good signal report. So, um, I was a member of this VKS737 about 20 years ago. I let it lapse because I wasn't using it. And I dare say everybody in the room here, if they were going caravanning or going camping or tripping around anywhere, you probably wouldn't get involved in this. You're probably going to use your own uh, uh, radio that you've got, your own amateur radio, where you can poke out 100 watts and you can put up a decent antenna 
or more power than that if you, if you need to. But I just thought I'd bring it along and, and uh, tell you about it. Um, that radio was in service uh, between 1975 and 1985. Um, it's fitted with 10 channels. I've got the seven frequencies in there at the moment uh, for the VKS uh, outfit. And the one I use the most is 8010. 8010. Now, it's only got USB at the moment. You can have them converted to uh, lower sideband and you can get the amateur frequencies put in. I did find out how much it was and it's, it's not cheap. But if you can do the work yourself, um, it's, uh, it's pretty good. I've, I've been running this off a motorbike battery, uh, an 18 amp hour motorbike battery at home, and I've also got my little van outside. I've got a uh, hardwired, a couple of terminals into the back of that, and it makes it very easy to set it up in the vehicle itself. Uh, you can hook your antenna up on, uh, it's got a, an SO239 connection there, or you can use just that uh, piece of wire straight into the terminal. And there's an earth terminal straight uh, right next to it too. Generally speaking with this one, I've just been using my trusty 303 bonnet and a bit of wire and driving it down if I can into a bit of moist ground. And that seems to work quite well. I also tested it at home on my home antenna, my big dipole, but if you talk to the head sheds at VK737, they don't like you using these radios from your home base station. They've, I've read that up in their book and they prefer to only be using it in the field. But I just wanted to see how it got out with my own antenna at home. So I did use that SO239 connection. So there we be. Um, that's probably enough about um, that little radio. Um, I paid $200 for that, and I also got another one for a fellow in Shepparton. Um, so th that's not a lot of money to pay for a radio that's uh, fairly robust and reliable. Fellas, if you haven't got any more questions about that, I'll move straight on to the 64 set. Just one? Yep. Um, that, we, had, um, we had lunchbox radios for the coaches for emergencies yep. on VKS, yep. and they were code and they were channelised. Yep. Um, but they were in a silver box and they came with their own um, wire antennas in a separate sort of pocket to the, to the side. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, that's the same error, but um, mm. I've never seen that one before. It's okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with yours, but I'd say it probably came out, might have come out a little bit after this one, perhaps. Uh, late 70s to mid 80s. Probably. Right, yeah, so this is 75 to 85. This might have been the model that followed it, maybe. Yes, yeah, okay. Um, Look, yeah, Kurt, so Kurt this, and we're, uh, this is the bag, this is the rigid edge bag that it comes in, and it's got a little pocket in the side there too. Um, fellas, the only, the other thing that I just thought of tonight, sorry? I just noticed that your lid completely detaches, the lid off the one we had, but only fold around like that. Oh, okay. Right, yeah, so that's a discreet little difference. Yeah. Fellas, I just thought I'd show you that thing tonight and you blokes are all experienced uh, radio operators in the field. I love getting out of, in the field putting an antenna up, whether it's a dipole or an NFED or a vertical. But a mate of mine gave me these little these sinkers, and you can't often, in Denny, up, up my way, well, you can't buy a sinker that big. Anyway, he gave me a couple, but you know, if you are throwing a uh, line up into a tree and you've got your best eight inch shifter on there, you can guarantee the first time you throw it, that's where it's going to stay. Because God's watching us and he wants to catch us out. And uh, I find with using something like that, if it does get jammed up there, it's not the end of the world. But, um, and you can throw something like that a fair way. You know, if you're going to throw it, you know, 40, 50 feet up in the air, or 40 feet anyway, you can do it with that. Okay, so I just thought I'd put that in there. I have snag quite a few things in trees over the years and I'm sure you blokes have too. <laughs> now, fellas, moving uh, right along, this is my second favourite radio behind the Klansman. Um, I was very lucky, uh, not too long after I got to SAS, my patrol was sent off to New Guinea for three weeks, uh, correction, 
for three months. We never used to go to Kanungra for our jungle training. The battalions did, but we went to New Guinea and we stomped all over the place with operational loads. We did a lot of hearts and mind stuff with the natives. Went down the Sepik River with salt and, and uh, things that we thought the natives needed. And we always had a good, reliable radio with us. Now, uh, the fellow who was the patrol SIG hadn't long come home from Vietnam and he carried one of these. Prior to that he'd been to Borneo and he carried the 510 set that you've probably heard about where uh, it was contained in two separate pouches, wasn't it? I'm not familiar with the radio but it was carried by SAS in Borneo and this came into service with SAS in 1966. Um, so SAS were in Borneo from 64, 65. They came straight home from Borneo, packed up their bongos and were deployed to uh, Vietnam. In 1966 was their first tour. And every squadron, we had three squadrons, each squadron did two tours and finished up on the 18th of October, 1971. Now, so this particular radio came into service um, in 1965, about 1965, and this is a 1965 model. It's actually serial number 81. I was able to trace that, its year, but I wasn't able to trace through all the records that SAS have got and the other signal squadrons around the country. I couldn't actually trace to find out whether it had ever been to Vietnam. So uh, I would like to do that, but I've got a mate in WA that's in the Historical Society and he's still chasing that up because he's got one of these as well. I'd love to know if it has been overseas. Um, there's a good chance it'll have because it's a very early model. Um, it was designed in the 1960s and it's also known as the Delco 5300. The Delco 5300 and that's the radio that was used by the CIA. So if you saw a Delco 5300 sitting next to this one, the ANPRC 64 set, you're not going to pick the difference. They're both exactly the same radios. Um, the frequency range is 2.2 to 6 uh, megahertz and it's in four bands. We used to have a primary frequency and a secondary frequency and a night frequency. And uh, if you couldn't get through on the first frequency, you'd go to with the other one. The other thing that I should say is that um, whilst every SAS patrol had at least one person that could send Morse code, because that's all we ever used, it was unusual if there's only one bloke in the patrol, because if he gets uh, shot, uh, it, you can't send messages if you don't know Morse code, if you've only got a Morse code set. But we were always working back to very, very good signalers. We had a signal squadron in WA called 152 SIG Squadron and their operators were absolutely superb. They could all do 20 words a minute. Uh, obviously they're sitting in uh, fairly comfortable conditions. We're out the bush tapping away on our key, on your knee or on the palm of your hand when it might be raining, the mosquitoes are getting at you and um, you're not in very good, uh, uh, comfortable conditions, that's for sure. But those fellows would recognise who the patrol was because uh, we'd send our patrol identification in the first couple of groups and if they knew that a bloke was only going to be working about 10 words a minute, they'd only send it at that speed. Um, and the other thing that I found is, even if you can send it 20 words a minute, you're better off to bring your speed back a bit so you don't make any mistakes because you, every letter that you sent is encoded and it takes a lot of time for them to find the error at their end uh, if you're making a lot of mistakes. Okay. Um, I'll just read you out, fellas, uh, just quickly the frequency uh, range in the four bands here. Uh, 2.2 to 2.85, 2.85 to 3.65, 3.6 to 4.70, 4.6 to 6 megahertz. Now, there's a chart on the, the lid here, which is very helpful. It tells you uh, uh, what the frequency range is, and also 
Um, it also tells you what your actual frequencies are that are fitted to this particular radio because they're not all exactly the same. Okay, so that's, that's very handy. Now, if you see the way this is wrapped up in this, um, it's like a Cordura piece of material and it's got these Velcro flaps on, we never used to use, take these out bush, these containers, because they were too noisy. Now, I probably can't demonstrate it much in this room tonight, but if you're out in the jungle, you're out in the jungle and you even make a noise like this, that's too much noise. We used to go bush for 10 days without speaking a single word. Everything was done with hand signals. The only time you would speak during the day was when the patrol commander would call. There's five in an SAS patrol. He'd call you in and you'd all be touching one another and he'd, you'd all have your maps out and he'd say, this is where we are. This is what we've done today. We crossed that creek back there 300 metres ago and this is what we're going to do tomorrow. We never posted sentries because we knew we hadn't made any noise and we hadn't left any tracks. So I just want to point out that things like Velcro were far too noisy to take to the field. So what we used to do, because they're not terribly waterproof, these sets, if you're walking through a creek and you haven't got that really well waterproofed, it's going to get wet and it's not going to work. And very, very difficult to dry stuff out in the jungle because if you're up there in the wet season, it's probably going to rain every day and uh, it's going to bucket down just on last light. Okay, so just a word about um, the container. We used to parachute with these. Um, because I was in free fall troop, we did a lot of jumps. I did 500 jumps while I was in free fall troop in those first uh, eight years. And uh, this was a really, really good to, uh, set to parachute with. You'd have it on the top of your pack because that's the thing that you've got to get out the first, uh, firstly, if something happens. Somebody might get injured, you, you've got to get your radio out, set an antenna up and, uh, and get a message away. The little battery that's in here, you can't get these batteries anymore, but I did research it and there's several people that have made their own. Amongst people like yourself in, in radio clubs, amateur radio clubs, there's some very clever people and one fellow actually copied one of the old originally batteries and uh, he did a very, very nice job on it. We always carry a spare battery um, within the patrol. So you'd have a fresh battery in there and someone else in the patrol that have a spare battery. If we went bush for a week or 10 days, very rarely did you crack that second battery. They, they, they don't draw much power and you're only using CW. So it's five watts output on CW, not much, and one watt on AM voice, but with my experience with these in the jungle, the voice capability was very, very poor. Very poor indeed. Your signal gets soaked up by the vegetation and we never had much success using them on voice, so we simply didn't use them on that, in that role. Um, it's got a couple of terminals here on the end for your earth and also for your end-fed antenna. Now, I'm just looking at the lid here to remind me how far we used, used to run an antenna out. It was always an end-fed antenna. Unless you are working out in the desert in Australia, we might put a dipole up. But generally speaking, with an end-fed antenna, uh, the SIG wouldn't go out to put it up. He'd be sitting in the centre with the patrol commander getting the message out, getting the message ready to send, and probably the scout and the medic would go out when everybody knew that they were going in a certain direction. He would go out and he'd run the air antenna up. So that was put in the jungle, uh, in the canopy, as far up as you could reach. So someone my height's only going to reach about less than two metres, or if we said two metres, it'd be about it. And you'd run out about 70 feet of wire and you'd let everybody in the patrol know that that's the angle that you're going out on, or that's the bearing that you're going out, and you'd never come back in unless you got the thumbs up. Because we shot two of our own blokes and killed them in Vietnam um, from that very purpose. Blokes going out to do something from the lying up point 
and not getting the recognition signal um, before they came back in. Okay, so uh, that was the two incidents that probably could have been avoided, but the people were cleared um, on, both, on both occasions. Uh, what else do we know about it? It's a very, very robust radio. In all the time uh, that I carried one, I've never, ever been let down in the field by it uh, because uh, something went wrong with it. And I don't think I can recall anybody else going back in and saying, oh, I couldn't get my message out because my radio wasn't working. They were very, very reliable. Obviously, if you're going to be parachuting with it, it's got to be well padded because um, when you deploy your parachute at 3,000 feet, the aircraft comes over at 12,000 feet, you get out of the aircraft, 40 to 50 seconds of free fall, deploy your parachute, and uh, the container, the pack that, uh, that you've got, which is sitting on your backside, that gets kicked onto your feet at 200 feet, and then it gets kicked off your feet at 200 feet onto a 22 foot suspension line. So that's swinging underneath you, underneath the canopy, and that hits the ground quite hard. So you've got to make sure that, uh, that it's all well padded. Um, the battery, interesting enough, has got three different voltages in it. It's got uh, four volts for receive, and then it's got 12 and 28 volts uh, for, uh, for send. It weighs about 7.25 pounds, so it's not terribly heavy. And as you can see, it's really only about the size of a loaf of bread. Um, we've said that it's 85 watts output and 1.5 on voice. Um, the other thing I didn't tell you too, when we put our antenna out broadside to the station um, that we um, are transmitting to, um, we just the bloke that secured it at the other end in the jungle, he'd put a slip knot on it because if you had to leave in a hurry, all you've got to do is give it a tug like that and you'll bring it in. We always carried a spare one because in the event that you did get followed up and you were sprung whilst you're in the field uh, and you had to leave that behind, you're not going to transmit too much without an antenna. So we always carried a spare one. Um, you can see this one here is set up um, for a dipole. Generally speaking, in the jungle, we would only be sending, um, you know, maybe over about 80 k's, perhaps 50 to 80 k's. But out in the uh, country in, in Australia, in the desert, I've worked back to Swanbourne about 800 k's with this little radio. No trouble at all. So it's a very, it's a very good bit of gear. Uh, okay, that's about it. Now, this little Morse key, fellas, you've probably seen those in your travels. That Morse key is exactly the same as the 510 key, which is the forerunner to this radio here, and it's the same key that's on the F1 radio, which is another radio that's uh, in use or was in use throughout the Army. So it wasn't just on this particular radio, and they're a really, really good little foolproof uh, uh, key. On top of the set, there's another key, which is a little bit more awkward to use, but if something happened that this went US, or you lost it, misplaced it, got separated from it, you can still send Morse off the top of the set, and I think that's a really, really good feature. It's not unlike the little Kodan uh, in, for the tuning, because there's a light in there that you, when you load the set up, and you hold your key down, uh, with it in the send position, you go for the brightest lamp there and that'll tell you that your antenna is tuned nicely. Um, and I, I think that's probably about it. Uh, once again, very, very economical on power, uh, which is always a good thing. Um, we never ever used to take a resupply for any reason at all in the bush. You don't want helicopters coming in and dropping you off spare parts for radios or more water or more rations or things like that. Once you get out there, you don't see a helicopter until uh, you're calling for extraction. Okay, so uh, that's the, that was the go there. Um, as far as skeds go, most of the time you only had one sked a day, but they had a listening watch 
24 hours a day. So if something happened, you walked into an enemy camp or something like that, and you had to send back some information, you knew that you could go and pull up in the bush and uh, send a message back. Now, um, it's not just a matter of pulling up in the bush 20 metres off a track and sending a message. You, if you're going to be pulled up there, you might be there for an hour and a half encoding and decoding messages, because after you send a message back to headquarters, you've got to receive one too. And uh, they might tell you to move to a certain grid reference or to go and do something completely different to what you're already doing. So you can be uh, sitting there mucking around with a radio for a couple of hours perhaps, depending on what the conditions are like and depending on how much traffic they're sending back to you. All our messages, as I said, were encoded and they're all in five, five letter groups. And uh, you, could, you could get a message out the bush of 80 groups. It wouldn't be unusual. 80 groups of five letters. So it's a, there's a fair bit of traffic there. Okay, so that's the ANPRC 64 in service with SAS from 66 to 1971. And after that, in a peacetime army up until the, the mid 80s. Okay, so good little set. Any questions on the 64 set? Yep. Did you ever use something called bat code? Bat code, no, no, but I know of it, but we didn't, we used, we used OTLP, one time letter pad, which had jumbled letters. Couldn't you keep that on your personal cell Yep, phone? yep, yeah, the SIG keeps it. And when you, when you were giving the orders to go out in the bush in the first place, the SIG always tells you which pocket he's carrying the, the code books in. Yep. No, I think the 510 was at the offset, wasn't it? Stage, but I got rid of to the Watsonian Museum. I think I was failed. Mm. Yep. 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 So, so if you're out in the field and you can see flat uh, transmitting something in code, that sounds like you need a big office desk and mic and things. How do you actually send the code to the message and then have it receive an encode message? How do you translate that when you're in the mud and the mosquito? Oh, well, you've got to make sure you, we normally put a little hoochie up, which is just a piece of plastic about two and a half metres by two metres, and we'd put that up. The rest of the patrol wouldn't uh, probably be under it. And that was just in case um, a shower came through or a heavy downpour, because you don't want your code books getting wet and you don't want this radio getting wet. So you'd be hiding in a really well concealed place under a little bit of plastic. Um, obviously you can't have torch lights and things like that. So um, it, it can be a bit difficult. And you've got a code book. You've got a code book. And the people back at your headquarters have got exactly the same code book. So if your code book was number 26, they've got 26 too. And it's got the same jumbled letters that you've got. So when you're in your first couple of groups, you would put your page and line number. So in your first group, it might be 02625. So that's uh, page 26. 25, line 25, and then they'd start encoding your message on that exact spot back at headquarters. You were mentioning you take out spare parts for that radio. What was the most common sort of spare part? No, the, the only thing it's is... It's not a valve, is it? It's not a valve. No, no, it's, yeah. it's transistor. Yeah. No, we wouldn't take any spare parts at all. Oh, no, oh, okay. No, nothing at all. Um, and we didn't need to take an extra key because you had that one on the top there. Right. Yeah. So, so it goes faulty, it starts Sorry? If it goes faulty. Yeah, if it went, up. no. And we weren't trained technicians either. Okay. No, we weren't trained in that, yeah. John, uh, in regards to uh, encoding the information that you send out, typically how long would it say it take to maybe uh, code, um, I don't know if you have to say 50 words or something like that? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it, was, it wasn't uh, very quick because it had to be done very, very accurately. So the, the SIG would sit down with the patrol commander and, because he's the bloke that makes the message up that he wants to send. So if I said, if you said 50 words, <coughs> that's not a very, 50 words, that's not a terribly long message. Oh, uh, that might take 20 minutes. 
Yep. But quite often the messages were far longer than that. Far longer. Yeah. Because if you saw people walking down a track, you've got to give a full description of them, what, they, what weapons they're carrying, what direction they're, what direction they were heading, uh, what you thought their intentions were and all that sort of stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. If you weren't using torches and things like that, how did you decode at night? Sorry? If you weren't using torches and such like that, how did you decode at night? Oh, uh, well, you could do it you have, you, with, a, with a red torch, with a with red torch, but you'd have something over the top of you. Yeah, but very difficult. Um, SAS never worked at night time in the jungle. No, never, never ever. No, it's too easy to stumble onto somebody. And uh, so we, fellas, we never ever uh, had sentries in a five-man patrol. You know you're not being followed up because you've been listening like crazy all day. You haven't seen any footprints. Um, so we wouldn't leave any sign that we were even there. Uh, it was the 2IC who travels down the back of the patrol, the fifth man. He would make sure that nobody's left a track of any sort. So uh, we had a lot of good personal security there. Yeah, so that was re very reassuring. John, okay. I assume the, uh, you mentioned the F1 before. Yep. The AMPRC 77 Yep. That came after that, I assume. Uh, I mean, the 64. Yeah, well, the, the 25 set became, that was the one before the 77 set. Yep. And they were both, most people wouldn't pick the difference between a 25 set and a 77, but they were a VHF set. So it's only uh, line of sight. But we never carried uh, voice comms. A couple of times they might have, if, if two patrols were going to marry up and become a fighting patrol, uh, you might carry uh, a voice comms, but um, it was uh, quite rare. They still use Morse? Sorry? They still use Morse? No, no, Morse is gone now. Fellas, I'm not sure of the exact date, but I'm thinking. Morse went out as far as SAS was concerned about the end of the 80s. You know, maybe around about 89 or something like that. That's when they paid it off because uh, the radios that they've got now and that started to come through at the end of the 80s, they didn't need to even encode like that. They could, the sophistication is so great that they could just push a button and you get a scrambled message comes out the other end. So, yeah, they've moved on a hell of a lot. So we happy with a 64 set? Very, very good little unit. Fellas, I want to talk now about um, this particular set called the Klansman or a PRC320. Now, I never carried one of these, but when I was in Malaya, they were uh, used by the British Army. And as I said, they came into service in 1976 and they were still in service at two, in 2010. So we're doing our maths there, 76 to 2000 is 24 years, add on 10 becomes 34. There's not too many radios that give that sort of service. Um, uh, none of our radios, I don't think, uh, stood the test of time like that. So if you have a look at it, this later on, you'll find that it's a very, very robust set. You could drive a Land Rover over that and I don't think you'd, uh, uh, that you'd worry the darn thing. It's, it was made by uh, Plessy and there were two other companies. Uh, what are they? Who were they? Uh, are they Australian? No, no, it's a, uh, no, British. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marconi was another one that was involved with Plessy. And there's a third one too, which escapes yeah. me at the moment. Wouldn't be Motorola. But uh, there's a fellow in the UK that distributes these... Uh, radios and his name is Steve Slack. Now don't be put off by the name because um, every dealing that I've had with him he's been really good. When I told him I was an ex-military SIG he picked out a fairly good clean one for me. Now when you buy these radios um, they'll tell you that they're working but that's as far as there's no guarantee with them at all. Um, I managed to get a fairly tidy one that uh, works nicely but they, he said to me as soon as you get it replace the capacitors because he said, if you don't do the capacitors, it could lead to more problems uh, down the track. So what I did, I got a mate of mine uh, from Shepparton, who's a really good tech, to replace the capacitors, and I used it for about another three four, or four months it, with upper sideband only, because that's 
how they come. They only come in up a side band. Um, and so I was happy with it was working. Everybody was complimenting me on the tone of the radio and I knew it was working nicely. So then we pulled it apart for the second time and we put the lower sideband uh, uh, switch and the loom in it. Now, it's not a job for the faint-hearted. Um, there's a fair bit in it. You've got to cut tracks and there's not a lot of room to move in there. And uh, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to be a bit careful about how you go, go about it. And the loom and the switch that I got from the UK, uh, from the fellow who provided all this gear, wasn't really very good quality. So we got a, a, a really good one and uh, we improved it out of sight. The radio itself has got a offset in it. So if I want to talk to you, last night I think we were on 3650, so I was on 3648. I was on 3648. There's an offset in there. I don't know why. It's something to do with the military being a bit paranoid about frequencies or something. Nobody's been able to tell me why. So there's a frequency offset in there. Uh, I need to be two KCs below. Um, when you have a look at the front of the uh, radio, these, these switches that are on the front are very, very robust and they're well protected with these fins. Now, I've seen some of the sets that, um, that they do offer for sale and uh, they're all broken off. I asked for a good clean one and he did the right thing and provided me with one. The battery is a five amp hour battery, but I've noticed when they first came out, these radios, that you could get a three amp hour, then you could get a four amp hour. And I just happened to get a five amp hour battery. And I've worked it out, I think you can use that for about 15 hours in the field um, without uh, having a flat battery. So that's, that's pretty good. The radio weighs about 11 kg, so it's not light. Um, and it's got a, this particular, call it a Bergen if you like. This particular Bergen, when you open it up, it's got straps inside to secure the radio. And uh, you know, you can have the antenna coming out the front at the top, and you could be walking along uh, using the handset and, well, with the antenna extended. Um, fellas, one of the things um, that I have done with great success with this radio, that's nine metres of wire. When the electrician wires your house, that's pretty much the wire that he uses. And I used nine metres of that wire, or correction, eight metres, eight metres, up my squid pole, straight up in the air, and I've been able to talk all over Australia on 30 watts, just with eight metres of wire up, up in the air. So it's, it tunes really well on uh, 20, 40 and 80 metres, um, and it's very, very simple to tune too. So something as simple as that. So how long would, would that take to put up in the field? Not very long. It's great stuff. Now, the other thing that I'm, I'm really fond of, I've become a bit paranoid about earthing. And this is something that I asked for when I got the radio. It's, um, it was brand new. When you're getting things off him, you can either ask for brand new stuff or you can ask for grade one or grade two. And I thought, well, counterpoise is the thing that I'm going to be using every time. I'll get a new one. So I did. Now that consists of four 10 metre reels of copper wire. And if I'm down on the river, which is where I normally am, or if I can find a nice spot by the river, I connect them up to my earth terminal, all out on a different angle, and I throw them in the, in the water. And it makes a huge difference. And to prove that, I've been, had the radio running, and I've disconnected it here, and the signal's just absolutely dropped off to nothing. Yeah, so counterpoise, is very handy. And I've also used the counterpoise on the, uh, on the codan as well. So I've just, uh, I think that's a good thing. I also, used, I also used the bayonet and drive that into the wet ground as well. So that's, uh, that's a handy thing. Now, the hand, the hand piece, um, I got that brand new uh, rather than a second hand one because that's the thing you use every time you go out in the field and uh, it's got the pressle switch 
you press it on the bottom of the uh, down there to engage it. So everything that comes with the Klansman is really well made, and even uh, even the connections, these heavy duty military connections, um, once they're on, they don't go anywhere. I've used this um, at home when I've been using the radio, when I've connected that up to my home antenna. I get a bit of noise where I am, and I've used this uh, headset, and I've found that to be very good. Um, that's got a pressle switch on the front here uh, that you use just the same as the pressle switch on that handset there, and I've found that to be really good. But once I get out in the field, um, I've basically got no noise, and it's just a pleasure to be on the radio when you're not getting all this noise that you get from home um, that's generated from where I am, from the rice mill and from the airport and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it's uh, really good. I've yes, yep. Uh, <coughs> once again, fellas, have you just come out the front and have a look at this at some point in time? That's the Morse key that comes with this particular set for CW. Um, I'm not doing much CW these days. I've probably got saturated with it. Um, and I tend to use voice more than anything. But that's the little Morse key that comes with it. And I think it's pretty good quality as well. Um, the radio's got two settings on it for power. It's got three watts and 30 watts. And I've tried it on both. And um, you'd be surprised how far you can even go on three watts if you've got a decent antenna up. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, yep, th this is, um, that's just, uh, that's the military spec uh, coax. And uh, th th that's, if, that's for your uh, dipole, when, it, when you want to run a dipole with it. But most of the time, I've either been using this, if I've got a bit of height, you'll be surprised how far you can go with that. I don't know whether you, anybody from here went down to Mount Franklin for that weekend that they have down there. I'm not sure what the height of Mount Franklin is down near Dalesford. I only went down for the one day. Um, I had other antennas with me, but I put this up and I spoke to, um, um, apart from the Northern Territory and um, Western Australia, I spoke to all the other states because they had plenty of height and it was just magic, just uh, using that eight foot antenna. Uh, what else have we got? Oh yeah, fellas, when I, when I hooked the, uh, that, that bit of copper wire in the top of this antenna, when it's extended at eight metres, I just, I lash it to a steel post or something else out in the field, uh, just with these two things, and once you put that up there, it goes nowhere. <coughs> Sometimes the wind comes up unexpected if you're out there for a while, um, I'll just explain a couple of the things without poking anybody's eye out here. It's got a couple of uh, safety features on it, this uh, radio. It makes a beeping noise if you haven't engaged everything that you need to when you're tuning it. For instance, if you're using it on, uh, uh, on 80 metres, if you haven't got your um, frequency dialed here properly for the right band, it'll make, you might have the numbers up the top here, you might have 3680 or 03680. Uh, you might have that put into the radio on the switches, but you mightn't have changed it on your band switch and it makes a beeping noise at you. So you know straight away, oh shit, I haven't, I haven't set the radio up properly. Uh, all those switches are very, very robust and um, you'd have to be doing something pretty silly to snap them off, I think. And uh, it hasn't got any sort of a meter on you to tell you what the signal strength is for the signal that's coming in, but it has got a little dial there about the size of a 10 cent piece to tell you when you've got the, the uh, antenna tuned properly. And normally you can get it to go around to 12 o'clock or tonight even when I was mucking around here, it went around to about two o'clock. Okay, so you know that you, you've got it tuned properly. If you can't get that dial to move, you, you haven't got your radio set properly. But it's very, very simple to use. Uh, what else can I tell you? Oh, the other thing is, 
It was used, um, it was carried in Northern Ireland by the British Army. It was used in the, uh, the first Gulf War, used in Afghanistan and also Iraq. So uh, they've given it a fairly good run over that time and also the Falklands. Now, I got in touch with Steve Slack about six months after I got this radio and I said, mate, this is the serial number of the radio you gave me, I'm really happy with it, use it uh, you know, three or four times a week perhaps. But I said, can you tell me if you are any records or has the Ministry of Defence got any records to show me whether this was used in the Middle East or the Falklands or, um, or Northern Ireland? And he said, no, he said, I've asked already and he said, I can't get that information. So uh, that's a bit of a shame. Um, if you have a look on the back of the set, there's a little bridging mount there. Um, if you're if you need to tune the antenna like we do with this one, you've got to have that in place. If you're just running an NFED uh, wire in, you don't have that there. So it's just a little, a nice little solid attachment. At home, in my, I have used this from my, out of my shack at home. So I've got um, about a, a speaker, it's about eight inches square and it's got um, a dial on the top to adjust the volume and everything and it plugs in here at the back as well and it's, it works very, very well. Obviously you're not going to take that to the field with you because it's, it's this big, but it's really, really good if you're going to be using it from a static position. I think that's probably about it. Um, anybody got any questions about the Klansman? Yep. Yep. Uh, what actual uh, unit were you using last night? Uh, last night I was using a Yaesu FT2000. Oh, that's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, before I came on to the uh, Bendigo net last night, I was on this radio for about an hour and a half, uh, talking to a bloke about two hours drive north of Denny. And when I came to come on with you fellas, the noise level just came out of nowhere and I really struggled with my radio to hear what was going on. I believe I was getting out okay, but the noise level was pretty bad. Oh, yeah, you're good yeah. Um, my plan was to give you a call on this radio last night, but um, there was no point trying when I had that, uh, that level of noise. The other thing that this radio hasn't got, there's no setting on the front of it, you know, where we can uh, squelch our noise out. There's no setting here the radio does it for you, uh, the way it's set up through the ALC, and it's got pretty good uh, noise cancelling. Okay, that's one of the good features, and it listens really well, it really does. Uh, when I first turned this on tonight, sitting here, I could hear uh, VK7 Northwest Tassie, NWT, on that, um, uh, what's it called, the bottle shop net, isn't it? Yeah. Tonight? Yep on 3590. I could hear him tonight from in here. Uh, I think that's about it, fellas. The one thing that gives me a, a lot of pleasure these days mucking around with radios is getting out in the field, getting away from all the noise, taking your dog down the bush, you've got plenty of tucker, and, uh, and getting on this radio and transmitting to somebody on 30 watts. And when you, when you say you're 500 k's away and you've just got um, a, a bit of wire up like that, they, you know, they doubt you, I think. I, do, I go on a net, not every afternoon, but there's another net that I go on and it's uh, 7093, which is the Candos net Candos, okay. of an afternoon. It starts about four o'clock. And I've been down the river a few times with this radio and I've chucked this bit of wire up and the bloke in Queensland says to me, geez, your signal's good today, John. And I'll tell him I'm down the bush. And he said, well, you're getting out better than you do at home. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's an amazing bit of kit. Fellas, I'll just go through my little dot points here to make sure I haven't missed anything. There were 15, about 15,000 of these radios used by uh, the POMs over those 34 years. Um, it's got a very, very high build quality. I think I touched on that. The tech that helped me put the capacitors in and the lower sideband switch and loom, he said he's never seen a modern day radio anything like it. 
Um, the charger that I've got is the proper charger for the radio. I've got that installed in my SIG shack at home and I can charge it while it's sitting on the radio there, like that. And I normally just put it on for about three or four hours and there's a green light that comes on and tells me that it's, um, that it's properly charged. Is that a lead acid cell? Sorry? A lead acid cell? Uh, it's an ICAD. It's an ICAD. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, Sorry? How many uh, 28. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fellas, that's probably as much as I can tell you about the radio. Um, good thing my wife is not listening, but I reckon by the time I got all the CES, all these different things that I wanted for the radio, another spare battery, as you know, freight is a killer from either America or the UK. It's a real killer. It doesn't have to be very heavy to get you a hundred dollar bill. Or, or, but yeah, those, when I got two batteries with the radio and most of the stuff that you see here, um, there wasn't much change out of a thousand dollars. So yeah, it's a, it's a fair bit of money. But if it's, um, I'm 72 years of age now, if it's gonna last me another seven or eight years, it's probably not so bad. That's why I didn't bring my wife with me this trip. <laughs> John, are you going to take part in the, uh, the RD? Yeah, the, R the, RD, the RD contest, WIAs, because if you're using that, the military gear, you get extra points. Oh, do you? Yeah. Okay, oh, right. <laughs> ah. Oh, very good. And if you, um, I think if you afford them as well, then you can get it. Sort of jump off that, so ah, okay. Yep, yep. I did use it on Anzac Day just to get in the spirit of things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, fellas, at some point in time, I think we're going to go outside and we'll just see if we can hear anybody and uh, probably try and give them a call from outside uh, on that table that's been put out there. Um, any, any more questions? I've got a stupid question. Yep. Uh, it's not a radio person either. Right. What, I've just discovered that there's a difference between SAS and Commander. What is the, and in fact that can be quite competitive, but what's the difference? Between SAS and Commanders? Yeah. Um, well, there are a hell of a lot of differences really. Um, the first one probably is the level of training. Um, they're not trained quite to the level that the SAS blokes are. They've got different roles and tasks. They might do uh, raids and things like that, whereas SAS are predominantly doing, they're certainly doing a lot of fighting patrols, of course, these days, but they're not um, going out in the bush in the same numbers that they would in commandos. The five-man patrol is still very much a part of SAS operations. They can bring bigger groups together for certain tasks. Um, Commandos have got a water operations capability the same as um, SAS have. Um, they're parachutists as well for static line and freefall. Um, but there are some discrete differences uh, in the way they go about uh, their role. SAS yeah. used for rescue, wasn't it? No, uh, no SAS. 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 No, 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 military. Oh, for, yeah. Yeah, yeah yep. someone get kidnapped. Yep. Yep. Um, fellas, one thing, um, it's, we've still been recorded, are we? We are, right. Um, one operation that I went in, we're talking about doing rescue operations. Uh, in 1977, there was a helicopter that went down in West Irian, and there was a pilot called, uh, by the name of Ralph Taylor, that was killed in, in an Iroquois helicopter. He was doing a joint mapping program for um, Australia and uh, Indonesia and the chopper crashed at 9,000 feet into the rainforest. And we were doing a big exercise at Tyndall and we got a call to go back to, uh, into the base area and we deployed to Tyndall to uh, get the body out of the chopper, uh, to blow the chopper up and, uh, and get his body back to Australia. And uh, there's a group up in uh, West Irian called the OPM who are a terrorist group, and we got word that they could raise 800 troops. Well, we didn't see that number, but they said that they could raise 800 troops in the event of um, 
that they were going to go into action. So anyway, we were winched in one at a time where the aircraft had crashed because at 9,000 feet, you can't put five blokes over the side of a helicopter and winch them in or repel them in. So the helicopter had to drop us off one at a time. So we got in there, uh, secured the area, uh, pulled the helicopter back off the body of the pilot using turfer jacks, those mechanical jacks with the cable. And um, then uh, we winched him out and we uh, blew the chopper up because it had a lot of sensitive gear in it for mapping. Because uh, we, were, we were getting maps for, uh, uh, for Australia and for Indonesia. Okay, so you just mentioned about, um, that was what's known as a recovery operation. Okay. Mm. Yeah, very good. Fellas, that's about all I've got. If anybody's got any more questions, happy to answer them. Uh, I was wondering about the difference in your signals training between, say, a guy from the signals unit, say somebody who was trained out of what's on you or something yep. like that? Yep. Well, we only had to qualify at 12 words a minute. They were 20? Yeah, they were about 20. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But all the people that we were working back to, they were all of that tw were tw 20. Yeah, they were all from a signals core of signals. Yeah. And the good thing about the 152 blokes, if we had to parachute in anywhere, they could do that as well. The, and their bush skills were really good too, so you could take them on patrol. And if you had a lot of traffic, if it was going to be something that you were going to be doing and you knew that there was going to be a lot more morse to send, you could take a signals troop bloke in with you and the, the patrol SIG like me, who's a 10 or 12 words a minute man, um, you're not going to be on the air anywhere near as long, okay? So it, they were really good operators, really good operators. So they were trained in water operations, they were trained in free fall and static line and all the rest of it. Yep, very good operators indeed. Okay, um, fellas, if you want to come out and have a look at some of the gear, and um, I'll, I'll be guided by the Hedge heads here tonight. Whether you want to go outside, and we'll just see if we can call somebody up on the radio. Yep, yeah, I think we can do it. What's up? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. We like. Okay. Um, just before we end the live stream, um, John. I don't oh. know whether you're a chocolate stream, yeah, but I'm oh, sure the wife is. Hell. Congratulations. Very <laughs> Thanks good. very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, fellas. <laughs> They've gone to a good home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah. yeah, very good. Okay, well, I can smell sausages or sausage rolls coming from the kitchen, so it might be time to pull them out of the oven. So we might have a break and then uh, have a bit of a play outside, possibly, mm. while we're doing that.